Although tanks are more recognizable, wheeled armored cars are the oldest form of armored vehicles. At the turn of the century, armored steam engines were used by the British Army during the Boer War. The First World War saw a profusion of armored cars. These vehicles were little more than conventional automobiles, fortified with a thin layer of armor. They were useful for scouting and raiding, but they were soon overshadowed by the tank. The armored car's wheels are both its greatest asset and its greatest liability. A tank distributes its weight across the broad surface of its track, reducing its ground pressure. An armored car's weight is supported only by the tiny contact patch where its wheels touch the ground. This means that a tank is better able to traverse mud, snow and soft ground, where an armored car can become hopelessly bogged down. As a result, armored cars saw limited use before the Second World War. They could not carry as much armor as tracked vehicles, so they were used mainly for reconnaissance missions, where they could remain on roads or hard ground. World War II saw innovations such as additional wheels to reduce ground pressure. Another improvement was to add a track assembly in the rear of the vehicle called a half-track. The post-war years saw many innovations in armored car design. The French Pinard EBR introduced the idea of supplementary wheels. Two pairs of wheels in the center of the vehicle would be kept in an elevated position when high speed was desired. But if they encountered mud, the wheels would be lowered for better traction. Another method to reduce ground pressure is to increase the surface area of the tire. This can be done by removing air from the tire, giving it a greater footprint on the ground. On the Soviet BTR-152, the driver could utilize external pipes to inflate or deflate the tires, depending on the terrain conditions. Another innovation was run-flat tires, which if punctured were still operational. Today's wheeled armored vehicles still have weight limitations and are therefore unable to be as heavily armored as tanks. Nonetheless, their usage has flourished, mostly due to their economy and functionality. Armored cars are widely used in two roles. They are the successors to ancient cavalry, using their speed and mobility to scout ahead of heavy tank forces, and to screen the unprotected flanks of large mobile formations. They are also used by many infantry forces, serving to carry troops into a battle under the cover of armor with better cross-country performance than trucks and other vehicles. The United States has always been one of the largest producers of wheeled armored vehicles. One of the most successful manufacturers is Cadillac Gage, whose Commando series has seen combat throughout the world. The V-150 Commando was used extensively by the Royal Saudi National Guard during the first Gulf War. One instance in which the V-150 was indispensable was during the Battle of Kafji, where the Saudis, initially outnumbered and overrun by Iraqi forces, helped to recapture the town street by street. The latest and most powerful variant of the Commando is the V-600, which offers the firepower of a main battle tank with the simplicity and low cost of an armored car. Advances in automotive technology give vehicles like these excellent cross-country performance, as well as much higher road speeds than tracked vehicles. The V-600 is armed with a 105mm gun, identical in performance to the one used on the M1 Abrams main battle tank. The V600 Commando has far more sophisticated fire controls than previous armored cars, which allows it to fire while on the move. In the 1980s, the U.S. Marine Corps began looking for a light armored vehicle to give their divisions additional mobility. 
they selected a design that had its origins in Switzerland. The Swiss firm Moag developed the Piranha series of wheeled armored vehicles using four, six, or eight wheeled configurations. The Piranha was designed as a state-of-the-art wheeled armored vehicle capable of operating in terrain conditions that would stop many existing wheeled armored vehicles. The Piranhas could be armed with a variety of weapons, ranging from simple machine gun turrets to elaborate turrets with large caliber tank guns. The U.S. Marine Corps selected an eight-wheeled variant of the Piranha family, the LAV-25. It is armed with a 25-millimeter Bushmaster automatic cannon, the same weapon used on the Army's M2 Bradley infantry fighting vehicle. Besides its three-man crew, the LAV-25 can carry an additional six Marines in its rear compartment. It is used for scouting, raiding, and screening operations, where its mobility can best be exploited. The LAV-25 can move in advance of Marine-mechanized formations, hunting out weak points in enemy positions. It offers the scouts the advantage of armor protection, as well as its considerable mobility in most terrain. The LAV-25 has a number of specialized variants. The LAV-AT is a tank hunter fitted with a hammerhead tow missile launcher for engaging hostile tanks. To provide fire support for the Marine units, there is a special mortar version armed with an 81 millimeter mortar in the rear compartment. The Marines have also deployed an air defense variant. The LAV-AD's primary mission is to protect forward Marine units from low altitude airborne threats. A secondary mission is to provide ground defense against light armored mechanized forces. The Blazer turret includes an infrared targeting site, a laser rangefinder, and the option of employing either Stinger missiles or the rapid fire GAU-12 25 mm Gatling gun. The LAVC squared is a command vehicle which carries Marine commanders into the battle zone and provides sufficient communication equipment to coordinate their unit's actions. The LAV units also have their own recovery vehicles to help repair damaged vehicles. The Marine Corps' interest in the LAV was closely tied to its traditional role in American overseas rapid deployment missions. These tasks require a special accent on mobility. The Marines sought a vehicle light enough to be airlifted, yet armed adequately to have an impact on the modern mechanized battlefield. A specific Marine requirement was that the LAV be light enough to be carried by CH-53E Super Stallions. The Super Stallion can carry an LAV for a considerable distance, even refueling in mid-air to extend its range. The LAV also proved well suited for airdrop missions. It takes an impressive set of parachutes to land a 12-ton LAV safely. Another approach to rapid insertion of armored vehicles in a landing zone is LAPES for Low Altitude Parachute Extraction System. The LAV saw extensive combat during 1991's Operation Desert Storm. The conditions in Saudi Arabia, with its hard desert soil, proved advantageous to the LAV's wheeled configuration. 
LAVs were used in many engagements, from the first encounters with the Iraqi forces in Kafji to the final assault on Kuwait City. In some armies, the use of wheeled armored vehicles has always been an advantage. A clear example has been the South African Defense Force. For decades, South Africa was involved in conflicts where their forces had to travel great distances with little logistical support. The Rattle Infantry Fighting Vehicle was especially useful during these engagements. Used primarily as a troop carrier, the Rattle's wheeled configuration was perfect for prolonged journeys over dense terrain. Early South African armored cars saw extensive use in the North African desert campaigns of World War II. In the 1960s, South Africa began production of the Eoland armored car, based on the French Panard AML. These proved to be extremely successful. In a number of skirmishes with Angolan forces, Eolans were able to knock out more powerful Soviet-manufactured T-55 tanks by exploiting the speed and mobility of the smaller armored car. The most ambitious South African armored vehicle to date is the Roycott, which replaced the Eoland armored cars. The South Africans have a unique conception of contemporary warfare based on their past combat experiences. They distinguish two general types of combat, high intensity operations and high mobility operations. High intensity operations such as major tank engagements are rare in the region. The more common form of combat has been high mobility operations involving battles between forces which are widely dispersed and often lightly armed. The Roycott's armament is a stabilized 76mm gun. This is lighter than the guns found on many armored cars. But the South Africans have found that such weapons are more than adequate for the types of enemy vehicles they typically engage. Wars in Africa usually involve formations of light armored vehicles. Heavy tank formations are uncommon. Mines, however, are a constant danger. South African armored vehicles like the Roycott incorporate special features such as V-shaped armored hulls to help reduce their vulnerability to landmines. They can continue to operate even after one or more wheels have been destroyed. The G6 Rhino is the largest of the South African wheeled armored vehicles. The G6 is one of the few large caliber artillery vehicles to use a wheeled configuration instead of tracks. It is designed to work in concert with the various types of wheeled vehicles used by the South African forces. The G6 is armed with a 155 mm 45 caliber gun which can fire projectiles to a distance of over 18 miles. The Rhino 6 crewmen sit in a fully protected armored turret from which they can fire up to three rounds a minute. With room for 45 complete rounds on board and a combat weight of over 50 tons, the Rhino self-propelled howitzer is one of the heaviest wheeled armored vehicles in existence and a clear example of South Africa's unique approach to armored vehicle design. In France, the latest in artillery systems also employs a wheeled chassis, but in a more compact and lightweight vehicle. Weighing just under 20 tons, the French César is a lightweight in the ranks of self-propelled artillery systems. But the light weight of the César does not limit its effectiveness in artillery delivery. Its 
155mm 52 caliber gun allows it to strike targets well over 21 miles away. The Cesar is equipped with all the systems needed for independent operation. An armored cabin to protect its five-man gun crew. An onboard ammunition supply of 18 rounds. An instrumentation for navigation, aiming, and command and control. Its lightweight and compact design make it ideal for rapid deployment forces. It is easily transportable by a C-130. For reconnaissance missions, the French use the AMX-10RC. This heavily armed vehicle carries a powerful 105mm gun and a 7.62mm machine gun. With its state-of-the-art navigational and battle management systems, the AMX-10RC is a cut above most other light armored vehicles. For self-protection, it is also equipped with the Galix defense system, which dispenses anti-personnel grenades, decoys, and large band smoke grenades. The AMX-10RC entered service with the French Army in 1980 and has been used extensively in combat, including the first Gulf War in Bosnia. With the end of the Cold War came a rise of global instability. When the Iron Curtain was finally drawn, the United States began to reduce its massive military presence in Europe and Asia. As a result, the Army's rapid response capability was weakened. In order to deploy its forces to global hotspots effectively, the Army needed to be transformed. In 1999, they announced the development of a new engagement doctrine centered around high-tech, rapid deployment combat brigades. Heavy tracked vehicles would be replaced by lighter, faster wheeled vehicles. The objective was to have brigade combat teams capable of being deployed anywhere in the world within 96 hours after liftoff. The centerpiece of the new brigades would be the Striker, a cutting edge wheeled combat vehicle. The Striker is an upgraded version of an existing platform, the LAV-3. While they share some major characteristics, eight wheels, a 350 horsepower diesel engine, and a 62 mile per hour top speed, the Striker has significant advantages over its predecessor. Taking advantage of new information technologies, the Striker is outfitted with a battle management system, which links it up with other similarly equipped vehicles, creating a digital battlefield communication system. Accurate positioning information is made available through a GPS receiver. Data is seamlessly and automatically transmitted to all levels of command, ensuring that striker brigades have real-time battlefield intelligence. To protect their crews, all strikers have advanced steel and ceramic armor, which can withstand a heavy pounding. Whether from 50 caliber machine gun fire, airburst fragments, or armor-piercing rounds. Strikers also boast some innovative technologies, such as run-flat tires that can be inflated or deflated from within the vehicle to adapt to surfaces from deep mud to paved roads. In addition to its defensive capabilities, the Striker is able to inflict plenty of damage. Its weapons system consists of either a 40 millimeter automatic grenade launcher or a 50 caliber heavy machine gun. A significant advantage of the Stryker family is its interchangeability of essential parts between its many variants. In the Stryker Brigade combat teams, each vehicle will be based on the Stryker design. 
Of the 10 proposed Stryker variants, the first to enter service is the Stryker Infantry Carrier Vehicle. The second version to be fielded is the 105mm Stryker Mobile Gun System. The Mobile Gun System provides direct fire support to infantry during urban operations. It isn't a tank, but it is equipped with the same 105mm cannon used on the M1 Abrams tank. The gun has a six-second autoloader with an eight-round ready magazine, and there are an additional ten rounds stored in the turret. All strikers are designed to be deployed by the C-130 transport. With giant rubber tires instead of noisy tracks, strikers are fast and quiet. They draw on the brigade's reconnaissance drones, eavesdropping equipment, and the Army's most advanced communications gear to outflank an enemy rather than overpower it. The Army is betting much of its future on the success of this 19-ton wheeled combat vehicle. In 2003, the Stryker made its combat debut in Operation Iraqi Freedom with the Army's first deployment of Stryker Brigade combat teams. The Stryker's advantages are plain to see. Its ability to carry a nine-man infantry squad. The interchangeability of its parts. Its firepower, advanced communications, and its ability to be rapidly deployed anywhere in the world. For years to come, these characteristics will help ensure the Stryker's dominance in the war on wheels. Wheeled vehicles were the pioneers of the modern armored vehicle. Technological advances have surmounted the early limitations of wheeled combat vehicles and transformed them into superior fighting machines. From the chariots of ancient warriors to today's advanced striker combat brigades, mobile combat has always meant war on wheels.